It's so good to be together today, on a rainy day, to drink tea together and to think about important things. And it's, it's something we can all be thankful for, that we can meet face to face. I think these days we can't always take that for granted. Uh, I've been tasked to offer a faith perspective uh, titled Suffering, Death and Dying. So I hope I'll um, set things in context. I thought I might start with... Um, maybe... <laughs> there we go. Uh, start with a piece of wisdom which comes uh, from the Hebrew Scriptures which is also in the Old Testament for Christian faith, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, uh, verses 1 to 8. I'm just going to offer one. It's very familiar. It's a piece of wisdom now, almost 3,000 years old. It's attributed to a man reflecting at the end of a long life, and the words are very familiar. I did think about singing that song to you by the birds for everything, turn, turn, turn. But Mr. Hanif begged me not to do that, so... Well, I have to save that for another time. A time to be born and a time to die. It's pragmatic. We know that. But there are things which can shorten life from a hoped for three score years and ten. And I think it's worth looking at three of those. Oh, I've gone the wrong way. The first is that famine shortens life. And there are many millions who are facing the reality of famine in our world, even as we sit here. This is a photo of a malnourished child in Afghanistan. There is an unfolding humanitarian crisis that we currently get glimpses of in the media. Last week, the ABC reported 14 million at risk of starvation. Earlier this week, that had been up to 23 million. That's just one country. So we know that famine shortens life. The second is that war shortens life, and we know that there are many facing and living with the reality of war and civil conflict. This is a photo from Syria, from the Syrian conflict, which captures some of that. And the third, of course, or the third, of course, is disease. And it's not just the disease we're focusing upon today. We might remember the reality of malaria in our world, in which an estimated 409,000 people died in 2019. This particular photo comes from Guinea in West Africa uh, from the midst of an Ebola virus outbreak, a virus that's so successful it eliminates itself within a relatively short period of time. But for us today, we're focusing upon the global pandemic. We've heard much about it. We've seen pictures. It has dominated our news cycle for almost two years. In 2003, of course, there was the, the coronavirus outbreak, which was known as SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. But that seemed to finish within six months. This one here that we're reflecting upon, the novel coronavirus, or COVID-19, has been with us for almost two years, and we have quite a long way to go, or so it would seem. Let's look at some statistics. The global statistics are uncomfortable, sobering. And this is from the World Health Organization website two days ago. So they will have changed if you look them up today. 258,164,425 infected, 5,166,192 deaths. And even though we recognise that there's a story behind the statistics, there's something about statistics that distances us from story. And I'll reflect uh, further about that a little bit later. So let's drill down a bit, because in the midst of the news cycle last year particularly, uh, there was a replacement from Australian media about sports statistics really to what was happening, particularly what was happening in our own country, what was happening in the US and what was happening in the UK. It's a strange thing, isn't it? We just reported on those English-speaking countries, almost like the rest of the world didn't exist or there were no other issues that were happening. 
but again, according to World Health Organization two days ago, the USA has experienced or recorded 47,599,296 infections, 768,565 deaths. That's the leading cause both of infection and death in the world. The UK, less, but still significant. But what about those other countries? You'll notice that the USA was first and the UK was fourth. It was really only towards the end of last year that the news cycle started to pick up on the reality of infections and variants coming from other countries. And so the second, the country that's experienced the second highest number of infections is India, uh, the third highest number of deaths, and Brazil, which has the third highest number of infections, but the second highest number of deaths. Really sobering stuff. One country, Brazil, Portuguese speaking, vast, 22 million plus infections, 612,000 782 deaths. What about our country, the place we call home? I've left the global statistics up there. <coughs> We've experienced 200,654 deaths, ah, infections, 1,968,000 deaths. Well, we have had some advantages. We are an island nation that locked down. We have good government, although there are many who would dispute that even protest violently. We have had, mercifully, so far, low numbers. And so for my family in the UK, different parts of the UK and in New York, they've said, really, you've had it easy. But I don't think anybody here in Australia would say it's been easy. So what are some of the, inverted commas, highlights from our own Australian experience? Well, I don't know about you, but I'm not planning to go on a cruise ship anytime soon. The name Ruby Princess comes to mind. Cruise ships were very much deemed newsworthy and recognised to be places where the virus not only uh, went rampant, but also came into the life of Australian communities. Then pretty hard on the heels of that, we learnt about nursing home vulnerabilities, first in New South Wales, remember Newmarch House, and then down in Victoria, St Basil's and others. We also recognise that hotel quarantine uh, was a risky thing and that infections into the wider community uh, repeatedly seem to come from people breaking hotel quarantine or from those facilities not being adequate. There have been COVID lockdowns in different places, both local and statewide with Melbourne uh, having the dubious accolade of having the longest lockdown in the world. There has been a weight to those, people unable to work, people suffering from anxiety and depression, people fearful. There have been COVID restrictions, all kinds of different restrictions, and I'll talk a bit about those in the next slide. I've had COVID testing. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but those who've had it know that it's not a lot of fun. And there is the ongoing debate now about COVID vaccination. For Australian faith communities, and I should have put that plural, uh, Australian faith communities, because we are a diverse mixture of communities here, it has been a very challenging piece. None of the faith leaders uh, had ever experienced direction from government, I think at least in Australia, that we were not allowed to physically meet kind of extraordinary catalyst for innovation. How can we be a faith community if we cannot physically meet? But somehow, that, that was introduced in Australia back in March last year, it became a catalyst for great innovation. And so faith leaders and practitioners uh, learnt how to be church using digital tools, so online communities, as well as keeping in touch with people who are not online. A uh, highlight for me last year, I was invited to preach simultaneously to three congregations. It was Trinity Sunday. And one of those congregations, the, the two ministers had invested time in training the old people in their congregations who are not online and who had never had a computer. They were bought iPads and trained to use those iPads. 
So I went on Trinity Sunday and an 83-year-old said, Cam, I just want you to look at my background. We were on Zoom and it was Rublev's icon of the Trinity. She said, do you think that's the right one? I was utterly gobsmacked at the shift because she'd never touched the computer until just two months beforehand. So it was a time of innovation in that kind of space and there was a sense of anxiety about what might happen because we have a lot of older people in our congregations who were deemed to be at risk over the age of 70. Of course, Delta has changed that and everybody seems to be at risk. There were restrictions when people moved around and when people were eventually allowed to come back for worship. We had to wear masks. And the smells of worship or gathering changed. Hand sanitizer seemed to pervade everything. Even uh, for Christians, when we broke bread together, the taste of hand sanitizer seemed to uh, come into play, and that wasn't great. Social distancing was recognised to be costly, and so people euphemistically changed it to physical distancing, but people have missed the opportunity to stand close together, sit close together, hold hands, embrace, all of those things. We've had to register for services, a bit like uh, little QPACs, and then QR codes, which are now linked to vaccination statuses. Hopefully, you've all got your green tick. Anyway, there have been restrictions on the number of people attending weddings and funerals, and last year there seemed to be a growing number of people who said, we'll just have the 10 and then have a memorial service when we're allowed together. It has been a very dislocated time. And there has been new language. Probably unprecedented has been the most overused word in 2020. But there have been other words which we have used at first with a sense of novelty and now almost with a sense of weariness. I'm just going to pivot. If this comes in, we will pivot from, on, from being face-to-face -to, -face to being online. Now we talk about hybrid church where we can be both at the same time face-to-face -face and online. Dare I say it, our gathering today is a hybrid gathering because there are a wonderful group of people before me now, but behind the camera lens there are other people joining us from other places, both within Australia and internationally. And we've learned skills to do that better and better and better. There's another kind of phrase that got a bit overused, which was liminal spaces where there's this sense of we're not really sure where we're going, we're just called to endure. And we have become very familiar with new ways for meetings, both for worship and for management. Zoom has almost become a verb. I Zoom, you Zoom, we Zoom together. Zoom meetings and teams. I mentioned how statistics can distance us from the personal story, so I'd like to dip into personal story uh, and introduce you to a very wonderful person, uh, my mum. My mother's name was Jenny. She lived in rural Wales in between two sheep farms. So Ed, I don't want you to get too excited about that, but we could compare notes. She's a retired magistrate, mother of three, grandmother of five, and one of the best cooks in the world. I don't have to say that. It's true. She celebrated 80 on the 16th of May 2020 and because of COVID restrictions, obviously I was not able to be there. But my brother, who visited her three times a week, did an amazing job of including us. My mother didn't have her hair cut for fear of COVID infection for nine months. I thought about sharing that photograph with you but thought it might be disrespectful because she didn't like it. This was a photo of her well-shorn utterly together with that magistrate's face on. Really? Anyway, this year, my brother and his wife, who is a nurse called from co general duties to COVID nursing. I can't tell you the number of times uh, Barbara and I have spoken on the phone and she has been crying because she has nursed people who shouldn't have died. People, not just older people, but younger people. She and my brother went to her father's funeral and that same day went down to see my mum. My mum had collapsed and was in great pain. Uh, so the ambulance was called and 
the only way they could control the pain was with morphine. So the, the health officers asked my brother to go with them in the ambulance to do the admission. And my brother's last memory of my mum alive was of her surrounded by people in full PPE begging him not to leave her. She died five days later, surrounded by caring people in full PPE. And there's a cost to that. For my brother, there was a great sense of grief because he knew how isolated she would feel. No visits were allowed, but the doctor recognised the trauma my brother was living with. And so at 2.30 one morning, just after she died, he said, I'm not really allowed to do this, but would you like to come and see your mum? It was a great gift to him, because then his last memory of my mum, not alive, but resting in death, was of her face utterly at peace. So that was a gift. But then we moved into a strange kind of space, because obviously I couldn't be there. And they said, uh, well, we have to prepare the, for the funeral and you're, uh, you're going to write the eulogy. I said, I haven't lived in the UK for 35 years. They said, it didn't matter because you are the oldest. And I said, well, I'll draft it and then you can bring in your other stories. Only four people were allowed at the cremation. Only 30 people were allowed at the funeral. It's an old Welsh church. The walls are over a metre thick, so it wasn't able to be live streamed. My hope is that next year I'll be able to go uh, to my mother's grave uh, for the first time and offer some tears and prayer there. But for me, there was that glimpse that many, 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 many more people than I have experienced greater griefs. Griefs like my brother and my sister unable to visit mum, isolated, frightened and alone. People in Australia unable to travel to visit people who are sick uh, or attend to the, the funerals and, and all the stuff that happens around that. I think if we paused and went around the room, many in this room would have similar stories, a sense of grief. I think in the season there is much to grieve and much to come to terms with. Considerable weariness, and continuing anxiety about what will happen next. So as faith communities, what would be our response? I want to offer three things. I'm going to draw particularly from, from Paul's writing in the New Testament. Somehow in the Christian church, we often think in threes. And so these three Paul affirmed and they continue to resonate. I think as a people of faith in response to our current time, we can agree that we are not abandoned by God when we are going through tough times and that God is with us in the midst of it all. And there is always hope. I think one of the gifts that faith brings, no matter what our faith, is that there is hope. And part of that hope, I think, is that the creativity and intelligence God has gifted humanity will find ways to combat the virus. The vaccinations that are currently available to us have been developed in extraordinarily rapid time. And uh, there is a great gift in that. Of course, there are other things we can hope for. I just wanted to name that particular one. And then the final one, love. I think in the midst of physical distancing, in the midst of uncertainty and anxiety, particularly in Queensland after December the 17th, once the border lifts, there is a continuing call to love God, take care of ourselves, and love our neighbour, whether they are vaccinated or unvaccinated. And that is a challenge. I want to go back to that pragmatic piece of wisdom I started with, but maybe read it more fully. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. 
a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. As a person of faith, to people of faith, I would suggest that we live in a season in which we can have faith, and that faith is life-giving. We can have hope, and that we can love. Thank you.